Hello, Protocols, Packets, and Programs. We begin our countdown to Halloween with notice of tropes to expect. Your phone is going to lose signal, your car is going to have trouble starting, and your business continuity plan will rely on an unmanaged shell script. Which means, this week we chat with Dean Agron from Oxi about securing cloud-native applications from code to infrastructure. In the news segment, Exchange Zero Days, Rancher Secrets, Dora Metrics, Usenix Papers, Passkey's Implementations, and more. Stay alive and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. Businesses need API protection that goes beyond signature matching and can stay ahead of attackers and their various tactics and tools. They need a solution that is more patient and prepared than a modern attacker and can track their actions over time. ThreadX is the only API attack protection platform that delivers on the promise of stopping API attacks in real time while giving you the visibility you need to prepare for future attacks. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash ThreadX. ThreatLocker is a global cybersecurity leader paving the way for businesses everywhere to implement a zero-trust security solution that not only protects business-critical data, but also helps mitigate cyber attacks. ThreatLocker's unique endpoint solutions help you to work smart and strengthen your security infrastructure from the ground up. ThreatLocker's allow listing, ring fencing, storage control, elevation control, and network access control solutions give you a more secure approach to blocking the exploits of unknown application vulnerabilities. If you're looking to enhance your cybersecurity and stop zero-day vulnerabilities exploiting your data, reach out to a ThreatLocker cyber hero today. Visit securityweekly.com slash ThreatLocker to learn more. Your organization is building and updating business-critical web applications faster than ever. And with so much pressure to move fast, you may find yourself making trade-offs between innovation and security. Now you can build fast without sacrificing security with Invicti, the application security platform that helps your dev, sec, and ops teams work together to secure every website, web app, and API. With unparalleled accuracy, coverage, and automation, Invicti scales like no other AppSec solution. Discover why many of the world's largest organizations innovate securely with Invicti. Visit securityweekly.com slash Invicti. This is episode 214, recorded October 3rd, 2022. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with John Kinsella, who I hope is excited about October as I am. I'm, I'm definitely excited about October. It's my favorite month for you to have a favorite month for <laughs> You're too kind. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Uh, I suppose for everyone else, please don't forget, as you're also enjoying October, don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings at securityweekly.com slash on-demand. Dean is the CEO and co-founder of Oxide. He is a cybersecurity expert with 15 years of diverse experience and executive positions, from kernel modules development to business partnerships enablement. Hello, Dean. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you, and we are going to dive into cloud security. There's a lot of aspects to that to talk about, but you have a background in kernel module development, and I'd love to maybe talk a little bit just about maybe that background, how you started, because in the differences you see between, I, I want to characterize it as the, the massive monolith of a, a Linux kernel to the ridiculousness, <laughs> distributed, crazy complication of a cloud environment. So I, I would even take it a step a step further and say that uh, I spent uh, several years at the uh, checkpoint and at Imperva, you know, building firewalls, building then building mm -hmm. web application firewalls. And one of my main project at Imperva at the early days was to take the Imperva physical appliance and actually convert it to a VM. So you know, it was mainly changing everything under the hood because the everything stayed the same. The only thing that have changed. Is the kernel uh, uh, is the kernel, which I believe in that time was a Zen uh, uh, Zen based flavor. So it requires a lot of you know we call it plumbing, but that was you know that, these were the early days of converting an appliance, a physical appliance, to a virtual machine uh, around I think ten or twelve years ago. 
Well, that's got to be similar to many companies on a larger scale converting their data center into that virtualized cloud environment, right? So that's the the, the common phrase is the lift and shift, which I think we've gotten away from perhaps as we talk about cloud native. So maybe that's our chance to then to say, what is cloud native application development to you? And, you know, what does that look like just in terms of, let's just focus on the development aspect, the the properties of code in the cloud. So the way I see it and, you know, the way we see it, um, eventually cloud native mostly focus on um, building applications to the cloud, in the cloud, using services that are also as part of the cloud. Usually it will be structured of containers uh, orchestrated by an orchestration mechanism like Kubernetes uh, using cloud third-party services. Uh, it can be managed services or non-managed services. It can be a databases that are part of the offering of the cloud service provider. Everything will be part of the cloud. And, and I think we, we haven't even touched on the... Um acronyms that I think are going to be present in the cloud. And we could pick on AWS and its service acronyms, or even just on the security side of things, SAS, DAST, IAST. I think there's also CNAP and other types of cloud-specific, I'm not going to say standards, I don't think that's quite the right word, but like frameworks, I suppose, security frameworks. So in all of this, how do we boil down a bunch of acronyms into just some practices that developers should be following and AppSec teams should be encouraging? So when you structure a modern AppSec program, I think one of the challenge is exactly what you're referring to. How am I taking solutions that were designed for monolith era and actually in the monolith, when I say monolith, I mean a chunk of code on a server, deployed on a server. That's what I, when I say one monolith, when I say cloud native, pieces of code on top of containers and managed, uh, orchestrated by Kubernetes in the cloud, communicating to one another, either directly or through other cloud services. Now, when you take existing AppSec solutions, those were designed to a monolith. Let's take the static assessment, for example, SAS. What is SAS? It's not SAS, it's SAS, Static Application Security Testing. It scans the code during development. And the way that static solution usually work is they build an abstract syntax tree, which uh, uh, allows uh, analyzing per specific vulnerable line of code, what the probability that they would be called by a user. Now, when the code is not big chunk, but actually multiple components being updated in different times by different teams, only meeting one another in production, static solutions may encounter challenges. Now, these challenges eventually are translated to, I would say, not lack of vulnerabilities, but the other way around, too many vulnerabilities. So, you know, that's, that's, that's an example of, you know, of a shift in the technology that was not followed, was not followed by a shift in the a solution or security yeah, and I solution. Think, yeah, and, and if I'm following that, I, I, I'll sort of translate it for, for to my mind as the premise of um, like functions as a service, lambdas, something like that, where we have a lot of individual capabilities, small bits of microservices talking to each other, which I think in principle sounds nice because rather than run an entire monolith as a least privilege, you can run different functions with different levels of privileges based on just what that function needs to call. But where I'm going with that is that now we've shifted perhaps the code problems that you were describing into IAM problems or um, infrastructure as code. So I'm curious as we talk about cloud native that, you know, people have been writing code 
in the Linux kernel. They've been writing code for for many many decades. In fact, we got to a you know uh, we got to the moon based on code that we were writing. But we have some complexity in the cloud environment that makes that requires people to be more experts than just running SAST um, that they were touching on. So I'm curious, you know, what is a, a mental model, or what are the, some of these? Uh, traps that developers fall into or have to be aware of that goes beyond just is that does this code have some vulns in it? So I agree that you know improper authentication and authorization is indeed a challenge, especially when the developers developer is not uh, all uh, always aware to the where would be the location of that piece and what are the requirements and what are the restrictions that uh, should be enforced. And here one of the needs or the requirements is the ability to collaborate, you know, with the DevOps teams. Now, I would add one more thing, which I think the motivation for Lambda functions for small pieces of code came from the operational side. The need to release code faster in smaller pieces, allow the team to dynamically, each team to focus on their piece of work, you know, the whole, I would say, DevOps or CI, CD uh, 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 change that uh, occurred in the last 10, 15 years. So, yeah, so that, that's interesting because it does pull in that idea of the, the operational side or maybe SREs who come in here who don't have security in the title, but have security practices coming out of them. And maybe this is a chance to turn the conversation from just the code that's written and deployed to cloud native application security, I think more broadly speaking. And here I'm going to loosely just define it as the infrastructure, the the services that are interacting with each other. So you mentioned a little bit about just finding the vulns. If you just you know if you show up talk to a, talk to a customer, talk to an organization, and say you know just ask a few questions, what are some questions you would ask, or what, what are some areas you would start to look at that would be good predictors that ah you're probably going to have a vuln here, a vuln here, a vuln here, even before you needed to to run a scanner of any sort. So I would say that um, I think that we need to change the terminology that we are using because a vulnerability is no longer a single line of code, but it's a chain that it can be structured of a vulnerable line of code, a misconfigured container, and a, a, and a misconfigured host. And then the configuration may affect the vulnerability. Another type is a vulnerability can be structured of multiple components where only one of them is open to the internet. So I think that the, the language should be a combination, should combine AppSec and CloudSec. A, a misconfigured container must be bundled with the application that it is part of to allow assessing the risk in a better manner. And I'm not, you know, these are not code vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. This is a mis, let's say that you have a misconfigured S3 bucket, the classic misconfiguration. What effect that it, uh, that it has on the business? What application is it uh, 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 tied to? And I think being application aware is where AppSec and CloudSec meet one another. That's interesting because I think what you're describing is you know better context and the the misconfigured S3 bucket doesn't have a CVE associated with it, which I think also implies it doesn't have a CVSS score. So suddenly now we do. I, I agree that co that context is helpful, but then how do we figure? How do we get that information that this is a misconfiguration that we care about and we should fix within a few hours versus this is a misconfiguration that's maybe less impactful. We can have an SLA of a, a day or a week, perhaps, things like that. This is exactly, exactly a, a, a where the responsibility is on us, the vendors, to, to provide a more broader and comprehensive assessment that does not only let you know, like, you know, I would say a commoditized CSPM, you have a, an open a, a S3 bucket. But say that, that we have an S3 bucket, that S3 bucket is tied to that application. That application has that business effect, and that's why you need to fix it, because this is a high-profile high application. On the other hand, uh, you may, you know, most likely you will find several S3 buckets or several vulnerabilities all from the same type. It's a matter of context. Now, context uh, uh, 
it, the word context is also very wide. What context? Uh, context of who's the team in charge or context of where in the application is it deployed? And I think th this leads to another term, which is a modern one when it comes to AppSec, which is visibility. First, understand what you have in front of you. What are the connections? Uh, this goes for the application structure in production, and this goes to the actual development processes. Once you have the map in front of you, then if you found one vulnerable spot, you can connect it to all the other play to all the other other layers. And it also works when you go from the application layer to the con to the you know, application code layer, a, a container, cluster, and cloud. Everything is bundled. With every with with everything bundled, that turns my mind in the direction of asset inventory. It's a classic problem, but also maybe s bombs. And here I'm thinking, you know, to just to riff a little bit on the the current Linux kernel. That's some you know a compiled packaged module that you could probably develop an s bomb for that says this is everything that went in and was included. Do s bombs exist in these cloud applications? Is or is that and, and I'm making sure to be clear, I know SBOMs are not a security solution on itself, but they are a part of visibility. And that's why I'm asking this. And I'm curious if SBOMs and the cloud make sense at all to help with that? I think in cloud, th those are even more mandatory than in monolith, because in cloud, you may not have the full scope. You need a technical solution to scope the application. When I'm saying scope, I mean the structure, the software bill of material, the list of ingredients. Now, I was in a panel last week with Checkmarks and Axonius. Axonius are asset management. Checkmarks, eh, 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 we are also familiar eh, with, their, eh, with their solution. And the conversation was around, uh, what do you do with ASPO? Uh, so you got the list. Most likely, it's a huge list. You have many components, um, some of them, eh, and SBOM refers to the one that were not developed in-house, which means the SBOM is a bit partial when you come to scope your application because you also want to know what part of your software were built in-house to know to which application those are tied. So I would say a full SBOM eventually includes all the ingredients with their context. Now that's the baseline. That's the baseline to start. And the next stage is enforcing policies on the ASMO. What is it? What is allowed? What is what isn't allowed? Because just generating lists won't, you know, it's not actionable items. Um, so that's my thought when it comes to ASMO. Part of that sounds to me is that um, the, the cloud perhaps makes it easier, not to necessarily to generate an S-bomb, but perhaps to generate that asset inventory, because I, I like to, perhaps not a funny joke, but to say, you know, all the cloud service providers, they want to they wanna charge you every single penny they can for every single, you know, CPU and bit of memory that you're using, so they know what's out there, what's executing. Hopefully that actually translates into an asset inventory, which in turn translates into things like infrastructure as code, that type of um, enforcing policy. And that's why I was thinking of that when you were when you were talking about that with S bombs. Do we have you know fill in the blank as code in a pretty robust and mature manner throughout the cloud? Are there still areas that we don't have those quote unquote as code solutions that we could do better with, whether it's on the inventory side or enforcement side within the cloud? So I, I would refer to the term as code as a standardized uh, uh, script script writing methodologies. Um, you know, all are written in the same form and therefore, you know, standardized and therefore anyone can use them. And I think that uh, the S code, uh, when it comes to infrastructure, is mostly aimed to the uh, auto scaling, the ability to automatically mm -hmm. grow and, uh, 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 or, and uh, uh, or I make your environment small. Excuse me for my broken my broken English here, but <laughs> All good. but but um, asset inventory is mandatory, you know. But you have different layers of assets. You have VMs, mm -hmm. which is the basic asset. On top of that, you have 
a, a containers, which is another asset. On top of that, you have services, which is another asset. Within these services, you have third party open source packages, another type of asset. There are many types of assets and eventually the goal of the asset inventory is to provide you that actionable items, uh, which, uh, ev which will eventually translate to policies on your as code, uh, 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 scripts, no matter what asset or what infrastructure you're trying to define. And I think the more a distributed application and environments are, the more requirement it would be for asset inventory, SBOM, all these type of know what you have visibility solutions, uh, uh, is the baseline, you know, is the starting point before even you, ass before even you start to assess the risk. Now, how does that how does that influence perhaps uh, developer behaviors? And here I'm thinking of whether it's building deploying systems or just reaching into production systems, configuring them, updating, etc. You know, are these practices that we've seen change for the better? Not you know, they're just different means of accessing production in the sense of. SSH or working through web consoles or everything actually in the cloud, we actually we finally have hit the everything is immutable and we always just redeploy and only ever redeploy from a from a blessed and code reviewed CI C D pipeline. So you know we, we have the we have the vision of immutable, but in reality it's somewhere in between. And I think that whenever every time that a developer does something manual or customized and it's not part of a process, uh, it may bite them in the ass eventually. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when you're building software in a high pace by multiple teams in different times, in different locations, on different systems, there must be some, there must be a standard that everyone are committed to or a process that everyone are committed to because otherwise Sooner or later, things would break. Now, I, right now, I, I'm in a startup. Things break because that's life. Now, eventually, it's a game of risk management, and we need to lower that risk. On the other hand, I would say that today, developers are expected uh, to do many more things than just writing code or writing business logic. For example, shift left in the security side. You, you know, we made the, the vendors and the industry made the developers in charge of the, on the security. Why? Because there is an operational challenge of securing a fast paced, uh, uh, developed app. So, you know, everyone said, okay, let's, let's add that responsibility on developers. I think that is, that's not the right uh, 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 approach. It's part of it. But again, it's a process. Security cannot be only on developers. Securing the app cannot be on the developers. They need to be trained, educated to write secure code. But security should be part of, of the process with the right tools and, you know, and the right, uh, 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 and the right processes, as I mentioned. How have you, have you seen that education aspect be successful or particularly effective um, in, in hopefully something, especially we're talking about cloud, cloud native apps. You know, we mentioned Lambda a little bit, you know, a lot, talking a lot about Kubernetes. There's a lot of other just cloud services out there that aren't really called out in terms of the OWASP top 10. So hopefully the education is something more than the OWASP top 10, or have you seen something successful or work with those developers so they do have that appreciation and understanding of security? So I think it, there's a whole a category of companies today um, that what they do is security training. Um, now, I think the best way to uh, train a, a security for developers is just when you open an issue or a security issue in JIRA for, for a developer to provide them the accurate training. And that way they will learn, uh, 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 and sorry for my Hiblish, with their hands. You know, they will learn through their hands because they will need to fix a security issue. And to do that in a, in a, uh, I would say in an accurate manner, they must know what they're doing. Now there is also the methodology of product security and security champions within the, uh, 
a dev organization. And again, the truth is somewhere in between. It's not just on the developers. It's not just on the security champions, but it's a combination. Now, I would say another thing, it's not only on the industry, but even when, you know, when developers are learning to code or learning the, you know, uh, I would say, uh, I wouldn't say I, I'm, a co- I'm a computer science uh, uh, grad. So, you know, during that time, during academic studies, to give that another a, 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 another part of education on security, even even only the basic one, but to give them something so they will be aware. Once you're aware, you know, it's you say that it's half of the solution. I'm curious too because I, I I do agree that you know hands on fixing just writing code is, is a great way to learn. But it can also, you know, here, here be dragons in the sense that what does a good remediation look like, especially if we're talking about a flaw in a line of code or a flaw in a, mis- in like a misconfiguration. So with IAM, with even service to service identities, things like that, how, are, are there, are there uh, recommendations you'd, you'd look to or there are guidance that you would give to say, this is how you do a good remediation for a vuln versus a bad remediation. And I realize it's a bit, uh, a bit vague and high level, but still curious if you, ha- if you can come up with an answer to that. So I think eventually uh, secure coding, and, but real secure coding is a proficiency. It's something you need to learn and uh, get very good at. And I think that my um, my tip or my advice would be uh, avoid the quick and dirty. Because and by the way, it 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 can contradict, so we can clash with the with the business needs, which solve this, this security issue as fast as you can and go back to building the app. But in order for developers to avoid security issues. They need the guidance from security professionals. They need the training. And then, you know, then you can, you can just send them to the web that will find everything they need there. Um, but most importantly, I think they need the time from their management and from, you know, from the teams to, to understand that that's a learning curve. That it's one of the things it's, I, I would say that it's not a, there is, there is no a, a quick fix. For that answer of how do you make developers uh, 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 more security aware? So the, the, I agree with you on that, but at the same time, we've been sending developers to websites for at least a decade now, and it it feels like that's not. Maybe we're not giving them enough time, or we're not. Um, it, I'm not sure if it's a prioritization thing, but I mean, we're we're still seeing you know. Even in the small world of, of, you know, the new world of, of containers and cloud native, it seems like we're still seeing a lot of the, the same things time and time again. Is there, is there a part of that you think we're missing? Is it, is it, are they going to the website and they're not paying attention or they're not soaking it in or it's going straight through their head or how can we make that better yet? Uh, I think that, uh, I would say that, you know, writing and we all agree that, uh, you know, using the right indentation when you write code is quite easy. You, know, mm-hmm. you have a methodology, you implement it, and, and that's it. But when when it comes to writing a secure code, um, it can sometimes be very hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and you need, there is a set of uh, rules that may change from one language to another, from one type of coding to another. And that's why I started by saying, I think it's a proficiency. Um, mm-hmm. And I agree that just sending them to websites and doing all of the, only that most likely will occur. You know, the developer will read the page and say, "Okay," and, and go back. <laughs> but if you but if you if you do that, if you once a, a developer encounter a, vulner, a vulnerability, and that vulnerability is tied to uh, some kind of a video or a dedicated page page that explained what are the most common methodologies. For solving that, providing examples, you know, it's it's like every uh, uh, other type of, of learning. So you know, it's uh, there's no magic here. Uh, on the other hand, I would say that the attack surface and the, the threat landscape, which is kind of the same, are expanding. 
in the past. You know, we didn't have the improper authentication and authorization for Lambda functions as a, as, as a, as a threat. And today, it's, it's, it's another one. So the landscape will get wider and wider. We will always chase, you know, uh, uh, the next type of technology and how we secure it. Um, you know, because uh, digital transformation is is always going on in one in one you know in one direction toward di- towards digital transformation. Um, so I think it's an it's an ever uh, ever ever recurring process. I I hope that answer your question, John. No, it does. It's, I'm 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 sorry. I'm 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 not ans- I'm not asking the the I'm not trying to make it difficult. Um, and what's interesting about what you said there around uh, the, the the lambdas in this is an example. So the 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 landscape and the uh, exposure footprint is is growing, but again the vulnerabilities aren't right. Like it's it's not the first time we've seen authentication issues. So it's it. I, I like your analogy there comparing to. Um, indentations, right? Something that w- it might be a religious thing. People might want to use tabs or spaces or whatever have you. Um, but still that that's sort of known and people have a, have a clean, simple answer to that versus how do you mitigate? Well, SQL injection's gotten better. Um, how do you authenticate your, your lambdas? I mean, I have a pretty, I think I've got a standard answer for that, but I suspect a lot of people don't. And that's why we're, we're having that issue. But uh, I, I think, you know, it depends on what type of vendor are you working with? Because hmm. I assume there are minor differences between the different cloud service providers. Huge. Yeah. And now, you know, let's say that in a year from now, Amazon or one of the other vendors comes out with a Lambda++, which is a different okay. type of Lambda. Uh, it, so, you know, it, it, and again, there will be not authentication and authorization issues, but Th- that made, you know, in the past we had like uh, LDAP, right? LDAP uh, was uh, the service that was in charge on, on, the, uh, uh, on the authorization. And, you know, we... Don't say cognito. Don't say cognito. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no, no I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, you know, rea- how, do, how do we say, you know, reality repeats itself in different, uh, like, uh, uh, in the next stage. Uh, again, I, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying, but the, yeah, yeah. these are my thoughts. We'll encounter... Mm. A similar issues, but in a different aspect. SQL injection in a monolith application is just SQL injection. But the SQL injection on top of a container that shares a namespace with the host may lead to a remote code execution on the host. Much riskier. You know, same SQL injection, but different risk. Uh, you know, life are getting more complex as you know as we get older. <laughs> <laughs> Part of that conversation to me sounds like, uh, you know, Dean, you were pointing out sending people, you know, to, to websites, to resources for education for their code. So this is the code security, the API security. And in a way, it, that makes sense, but it wasn't necessarily the cloud security part, meaning th- there is, to, to riff on the Lambda that we've been talking about, there's a way to handle the secrets or do authentication within a Lambda. But does that feel like it's we're getting too much of a vendor lock-in because it's that specific to this cloud service provider? Or we're, we have to actually now educate developers not only on the be proficient in secure coding, but be proficient in a cloud environment. So we now have like... The, the Azure, the Google, the 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 cloud specific expertise of training. I think you know. Eventually, it it, it depends because the cloud vendor, each vendor, will try to initiate the lock in as much as they can, you know, to make sure you continue working with AWS or Azure or GCP. That's you know that's business. On the other hand, I think. It's on the vendors, uh, by the way, for as part of their business motivation to support as many platforms as possible and to allow the users, uh, you know, to transparently shift, to be agnostic to the uh, mm-hmm. platforms. So uh, I think that a, a security vendors um, for their own sake should be as agnostic as possible to everything as possible. Code languages, uh, 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 dev platforms, uh, uh, cloud service providers. Um, on the other hand, it's not always easy, and it's a game of again a risk analysis. Where do I put? Where do I invest my resources as a vendor, as a startup? So, 
again, uh, that would be uh, my best answer here. <laughs> a different way of asking that too is a lot of the, the cloud service providers, you know, Amazon liked the, the started off that idea of the, the shared responsibility, or we could call it the shared fate, or um, you know, other other synonyms like that about who should deal with what part of security. As you work with these clouds, you know, um, from from your own vendor perspective. Have you seen a process or a progress where the the defaults in these cloud environments are just better? Uh, because I, I think of like a, I think there's a 20 or 30 page hardening guide for Kubernetes, for example, where it would be lovely if Kubernetes was more secure just by default out of the box. I don't know that we can have a default secure cloud out of the box. That sounds like a bit too abstract. But is uh, do, do you see that progress towards cloud service providers doing things, offering just better defaults, better configurations for developers to use rather than let, letting them make mistakes so easily? Um, like always, I think life is a bit more complicated. It's a game of granular <laughs> granularity enough. of the configuration versus hardening. You know, as, as a cloud service provider, I want to allow my, I'm, I'm the, I'm the controller as the, as the GDPR defines. I'm not the owner, the data owner of the data processor. And that's, that's for that reason, I'm providing the platform. Now it's the role of the cloud security vendors to make sure that what they provide is a secure from their side, but on the other hand, I don't think that developer uh, 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 will uh, would accept, you know, hardening at the get go, um, because eventually it's code, and that's the magic with code. We can do everything. We can create a software. That software will do whatever we want. We could, you know, we can change the code, and putting a uh, guardrails uh, is a I would say um, is a double edged sword. On the one hand, it can provide a better security. On the other hand, it limits granularity and customization, um, and that depends on their on the on their customer. Now, with Google, I would say Google has the advantage of, you know, they were they were the first to implement zero trust. I think they've called it Beyond Cope. Mm -hmm. It was a full blown methodology built by Google. Not every organization is Google. Not every organization has the capabilities of implementing the same working methods as Google because there are other restrictions and other limitations. So again, it's, it's a game of, of, uh, of best effort of how close do you get to that optimum Google level, uh, uh, Google level uh, 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 implementation of processes. Um, and regarding secured cloud, secured, uh, uh, how, uh, uh, what part of the ownership of the security ownership uh, 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 is on the cloud service provider? Um, I think um, they prov it's it's the basic level of the of again I'm going to say infrastructure, but it's not really infrastructure because it's even below that. Um, so again, I'm I'm going I'm going around myself here, but I think eventually it's complicated. And no, <laughs> the, the, the line between security and granularity is very, uh, very vague. Yes. Well, well, hopefully we don't come around so full circle that we take uh, the the origins of 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 the web and start implementing JavaScript as a service within uh, cloud <laughs> environments. That would be a little too far. Uh, but, but setting that aside, uh, Dean, is there something that we should be looking forward to on the horizon, or is there a particular uh, call to action that you'd love to to send out to our listeners? Um, you know, I would say that at Oxi, uh, we are focusing on securing cloud native applications. We are focusing on container based, Kubernetes based applications. Uh, our, I recommend, you know, the listeners to go into our blog and read the different researches that we are, that we are publishing and the methodologies uh, uh, that we are publishing, focusing on that uh, new type of AppSec and maybe gain something out of there uh, and make sure that, you know, the vulnerabilities that we dis disclose are updated. Uh, if it's uh, on Harbor, if it's on another one that we're gonna publish in the next few days uh, and give us a call, we'll be happy to help and, and, and advise. 
Uh, yeah, thank you for that. And it's always interesting because a lot of these cloud-related vulns, as we've been talking about on the show, don't have CVEs, and they're a bit, di- uh, bit difficult and yet important to track. So thanks for that, Dean. Sure thing. Thank you very much. I want to thank John as well and thank everybody for listening. We're going to take a quick break now and return with news of the week. <laughs> 